Hello and welcome to the Mormon Yeshiva. This presentation is entitled um, The Astrotheology of the Book of Mormon. Uh, this will be part one of a probably, a, well, several part theory, uh, series. I've got several that I've done over the last few months, and this is the first one I'll be putting out. Uh, so the first today we're going to go through 1 Nephi 16. Again, please make note of our fair use disclaimer. Everything here is just for educational purposes, and I hope that you will take it in the spirit in which it was meant. In the ancient Israelite prophetic tradition, the, uh, the concepts related to what we call the Mazarot, or the Zodiac, which is a wheel of stars uh, are pretty much around the earth, which we, from which we observe uh, months and seasons of the year. This would be like things like, if you look to the left there, these are your particular zodiacal signs like Cancer, Leo, Aquarius, Sagittarius, all of these particular signs. And it's considered a wheel, okay, or a ring, if you will. And uh, it, so it's a 360-degree circle divided into 36 decans, or sections of 10 degrees. Each particular season or zodiacal sign, like Cancer or the Leo, contains three decans, or 30 degrees, of the wheel. Uh, in all, it is also related to the concept of one eternal round. So in Israel, understanding the scriptures uh, is uniquely tied to the symbolism of what we call the Mazarot, or the signs in the stars above. As the scriptures say, the heavens declare the glory of God. Without understanding the Mazarot, we are left to a very in a sense, a, a really two-dimensional understanding of the scriptures. Because as a sealed text, the book, which the Book of Mormon is, it is written on a, it's encoded, meaning encoded, or it's written in a multi-dimensional fashion that it contains many stories and many teachings all at the same time. And the teachings of the stars and how they relate to the gospel is just one of those dimensions. And we're going to start taking a look at some of these symbols throughout the text. In 1st Nephi 10:19, notice that it states, For he that diligently seeketh shall find, and the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto them by the power of the Holy Ghost, as well as in these times, as in times of old, as well as in times of old, as in times to come. Wherefore, the course of the Lord is one eternal round. Well, in the symbolism of the Masoret, the Lord would be the sun as it travels, you know, through the the the, the signs of the of the Masoret or the zodiac, and so it travels in a circular course all the way through, all the way around the signs of the zodiac. So it's a one eternal round. It you know it starts at the beginning, it continues. If we take a closer look to the diagram at the left here. Um, the, the sun follows through several several areas. If we start in the spring or vernal equinox, um, you know the sun it's, it's the first major gate where the sun begins to climb what is called the mountain of the Lord's house. It ascends through Taurus and Gemini and then to Cancer, and then where it finds its zenith in the summer solstice. Then as it travels, it goes back and it, goes, it starts to go you know back down or wane. As it approaches, it goes through Leo, Virgo, and then to Libra, which contains the autumnal or fall equinox. And then, of course, as it continues, the sun begins to decline even more, going into what sometimes referred to in some areas as the land of the dead or the mighty waters. Um, and uh, as it, it goes down, it finds its death at the winter solstice or in the constellation Capricorn, where it then proceeds to climb back up and go toward the mountain and going back up the you know back up the uh, all the way through Aquarius and Pisces and Aries as it goes back towards uh, the other gates of the and, and markers of the year so in first Nephi 16 we're going to start examining some of these uh, uh, some of these particular symbols um, we could start at their very first chapter, in fact, but I started here only because it's their journeying in the wilderness. So notice it says, And it came to pass, in verse 12, that we did take our tents and departed to the wilderness across the river 
Lehman. Now, first thing you should note is that to take our tense, pitching tense dwelt in tense, it usually has strong, uh, this is, you're, you're know that is a prophetic marker that you are in a temple teaching and something of a strong prophetic nature and specifically something associated with the Maserot. Okay, the wilderness is the journey around the Maserot or the stars, the stars above the zodiac itself. As you go around that circuit, uh, that is called the wilderness in, the, in ancient Israel. And then, of course, the river, Laman, in this case, the river symbol is, is the constellation Aquarius. Not that Laman is Aquarius, but it's called the river Laman. So it says, you know, so it says here that it came to pass, we did take our tents and depart into the wilderness across the river Laman. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that um, this particular part of the journey is going to correspond on the, on the, on the zodiacal wheel or the Maserot to the symbol of Aquarius. So we're going to start there in Aquarius. So we note here on the left that the river Laman is this, the river of, you know, of Laman or river Laman is a symbol for Aquarius. It's a water symbol. The, the waters that pour out from the water bearer, the river, this way you get rivers, uh, lakes, streams, those kind of things, uh, is the symbol for Aquarius. And it says here, so we're going to start there, okay? That's our major, that's our symbol to start with in this particular section. And it came to pass that we traveled for the space of four days, nearly a south, southeasterly direction, and we did pitch our tents again, and we did call the name of the place Shazer. Now, what's interesting is if you go directly south on the zodiacal wheel, you are in the constellation Capricorn, that's south. If we go south and east, we find ourselves in the constellation Sagittarius, the bowman, the half horse, half man uh, symbol. Okay, so south is Capricorn, southeast would be Sagittarius. Okay. Four days south, southeast from Aquarius, leads us to what we call the third decan of Sagittarius, which is governed by the planet Saturn. Okay. And notice what we find in verse 14. Okay. They're in, uh, according to the symbolism, the south southeast reduction, they arrive in what is a symbol that is equated to Sagittarius, the bowmen, bows and arrows. Okay. And let's take a look at what we find in verse 14. Notice what it says, and it came to pass that we did take our bows and arrows, Sagittarius, symbol for Sagittarius, and to go forth into the wilderness to slay food for our families. And after we had slain food for our families, we did return again to our families in the wilderness, to the place of Shazer. Shazer means, uh, it's connected to the idea of t twisting or twined. I'm not exactly sure exactly what the astronomical correlation on that is, or if there is one. But that basically is the idea. It's a, it's a twisting, uh, something that's twisted like fine twine linen. And uh, we did go forth again in the wilderness, following the same direction, keeping in the most fertile parts of the wilderness, which were in the borders near the Red Sea. Now, it says here, And it came to pass that we did travel for the space of many days, slaying food by the way with our bows and our arrows and our stones and our slings. So all of these, these bow and arrow symbols, there's words here, are meant to, to point our attention to the constellation Sagittarius. So in a sense, as we proceed in this journey, we're taking a walk around the Maserot or the Zodiac. So Nephi in his journey is leading us around varying symbols of the Zodiac. These symbols are meant to communicate certain principles to us. The problem is in our modern culture, especially our Gentile culture, we've lost the understanding of many of these stellar symbols. Uh, unfortunately, it's devolved or, or, you know, just or become a counterfeit in some ways when we see things like modern astrology, where people try to foretell the future. In this case, what we're seeing is while the stars can be used as prophetic signs, they're also meant to, to as we see, to communicate principles and understanding regarding the gospel. So we have to be careful not to allow ourselves to devolve into many of the you know, practices of modern ast astrology when what we're looking at is an astrotheological and astronomical picture and science that is being given in the Book of Mormon. So as it continues, so we take this journey, notice it says, 
in verse 16. And we did follow the directions of the ball, meaning the Liahona, which led us in the more fertile parts of the wilderness. And after we had traveled for, many for the space of many days, we did pitch our tents. Ah, another prophetic marker, pitch our tents. So this we know we're getting ready to talk about something more in the Maserot for the space of a time. Okay, time can be a season or a specific number of degrees on the zodiacal wheel or the Maserot. Okay, that we might again rest ourselves and obtain food for our families. And it came to pass that as I, Nephi, went forth to slay food, behold, I did break my bow. Okay, bow symbol, Sagittarius again. Behold, my brethren were angry with me because of the loss of my bow, for we did obtain no food. And it came to pass that we did return without food to our families, and being much fatigued because of their journeying, they did suffer much for the want of food. At this point, because of the suffering for want or much food, uh, we find in verse 20 the passage where Laman and Lemuel begin to murmur exceedingly against Nephi. Here it says, And it came to pass that Laman and Lemuel and the sons of Ishmael did begin to murmur exceedingly because of their sufferings and affliction in the wilderness. And also my father began to murmur against the Lord his God. Yes, they were all exceedingly sorrowful, even that they did murmur against the Lord. Now, when you see the idea of the two brothers, two brothers, in this case, like Laman and Lemuel mentioned side by side, okay, we see the, the symbol of Gemini, which is called the two brothers. What is interesting about the constellation Gemini is that uh, Gemini is, a, is what we call the opposing sign to Sagittarius. So here's Nephi with his bow in Sagittarius, and then across the wheel, you, at the top here, you see Gemini, which is the opposite or opposing sign. And notice we see Lemon and Lemuel, when they're mentioned together in the text, as a symbol for Ge the, the constellation Gemini on the wheel, opposing Sagittarius, or being an opposing sign to Sagittarius. So they're murmuring and complaining against him, again, teaching us a principle that the constellation Gemini is an opposing symbol to that of Sagittarius. And again, there are some other relationships there. And what we want to try to do is pay attention to, this, to the patterns being presented, as well as to explore what the relationships and the meanings of these ancient signs of the Maserat were to the ancients. Not to us modernly, but what did it mean to them? Now, as they go on, they continue their journey. And notice what it says. In verse 21, now it came to pass that I, Nephi, having been afflicted because of my brethren, so remember, Sagittarius, in this case, Nephi with his bow, Sagittarius because of the loss of his bow, uh, being opposed by his brethren, Laman and Lemuel, specifically Gemini, the opposing sign, and their bows having lost their springs, it began to be exceedingly difficult, yes, insomuch that we could obtain no food. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, did speak much unto my brethren because they had hardened their hearts again, yes, even, or even unto the complaining against the Lord their God. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, did make out of, a, out of wood a bow, and out of a straight stick an arrow. Wherefore I did arm myself with a bow and arrow, again, Sagittarius sign, with a sling and with stones, and I said to my father, Whither shall I go to obtain food? And it came to pass that he did inquire of the Lord, for they had humbled themselves because of my words. For I did say many things unto them in the energy of my soul. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came unto my father, and he was truly chastened because of his murmuring against the Lord, insomuch that he was brought down into the depths of sorrow. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord said to him, Look upon the ball, and behold the things which are written. Now this is a very important principle, because many people often do not realize that the liahona, or the ball, is, a, is an instrument that is specifically associated and connected to understanding the Maserot or the Zodiac above. In other words, there's a relationship between the Liahona and the Zodiac. Uh, it's a ball. It's a, it, you know, the writing appears in the circumference or, the, or in the, in the, that appears on the ball. And so it's basically explained to you that this particular instrument is somehow connected to the stars above, specifically those 12 stars in the zodiac. Okay, and it's, it goes on, it says, And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord said to him, Look upon the ball, and behold the things which are written. And it came to pass that when my father beheld the things which were written upon the ball, he did fear and tremble exceedingly, and also my brethren and the sons of Ishmael and our wives. 
And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the pointers which were in the ball, that they did work according to the faith and diligence and heed which we did give unto them. Now we'll take a little side note here. Uh, the Liahona, uh, at, as it's connected to the Maserot, is also another description of it is found in Alma 37. And here, Alma 37, verse 38, it says, And now, my son, I have somewhat to say concerning the thing which our fathers call a ball or director. And our fathers called it Liahona, which is in being interpreted, okay, a compass, and the Lord prepared it. Now, the word Liahona itself, um, we often think, okay, the Ahona must mean a ball or a compass and the Lord prepared it. Another another way of looking at it is the Ahona, which being interpreted, which means when you see that word being interpreted, you want to go back to the Torah, to the Old Testament, and find usually the first mention of the particular words that this particular prophet is talking about. So we want to find the words compass and the phrase the Lord prepared it to give us a further understanding. We actually find these phrases in Exodus. Now, I'm not going to go into it too detail here because I have another presentation I'll put out in the future regarding that particular uh, understanding of what it means that being, of it being interpreted, okay, and specifically the Liahona. But the idea is that a compass or a circuit and the Lord prepared it is actually connected to the bronze altar and the altars found in the tabernacle of Moses. So this is particularly, these the relationships are found in, notice, a temple theme. And of course it says, And behold, there cannot any man work after the manner of so curious a workmanship. Curious workmanship, another prophetic marker. Something of the, of the heavens above is being discussed here. And behold, it was prepared to show our fathers the course which they should travel in the wilderness. In other words, it was prepared to show their fathers the course which they should travel in the wilderness, which is a symbol for their journey, in, not only in the physical wilderness, but their journey as you know the the the, the cycle of the zodiac, you know, turns in the heavens above, if you will. Now we'll go back to First Nephi 16, verse 29. And there was also written upon them a new writing, which was plain to be read, which did give us understanding concerning the ways of the Lord. And it was written and changed from time to time, according to the faith and diligence which we, which we gave unto it. And thus we see that by small means the Lord can bring about great things. The idea that the, the Liahona is connected to the Maserot, the Maserot uh, uh, which, or the Zodiac above, um, it's the idea that the prophetic traditions of ancient Israel are connected to the stars. And why the stars? Well, specifically because that's probably the one thing mankind really cannot change. They may be able to, uh, you know, obscure or our understanding or or to withhold knowledge about what the ancient meanings of these of these signs were in the heavens, but they cannot change them. So when we are looking at the stars above, we need to understand that the prophetic tradition of ancient Israel is, is highly interwoven into the understanding of specifically the Maserot, you know, the, the zodiac, and the stars above. So notice in verse 30 it says, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, did go forth into the top of the mountain according to the directions which were given upon the ball. The top of the mountain is actually what we would call the summer solstice, where the sun reaches its zenith. In other words, if we were to start, like, you know, Capricorn is a ram, uh, you know, or, you know or, excuse me, Capricorn is a goat. So at the very southern sign, we're at the darkest time of the year. And from that point on, from the winter solstice on, light begins to increase until the sun is, in a sense, birthed again in the constellation Aries. Okay, so if we start at the bottom, Capricorn, and we go, you know, we follow it up from, through Aquarius, Pisces, and then into Aries. Aries is where we find the, um, the, uh, the excuse me, the, the vernal equinox or the spring equinox where the sun is birthed. Okay, and then it climbs up the mountain, if you will, through Taurus, Gemini, until it reaches the winter, excuse me, the summer solstice in Cancer, which is this, where for three days it appears as if the sun does not move. And at that point, um, you know, you're, you're at the zenith. You are at the top of the mountain. Okay, you are in a place of bounty. In ancient Israel, it's, 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 it's 
connected to the idea of a land flowing with milk and honey. Um, but here the, 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 the sun reaches its zenith at the summer solstice. So when he's going into the top of the mountain, the symbol there is the sun is reaching its zenith at the summer solstice. So as we've said, Cancer, the, the constellation Cancer in the zodiac, represents the top of the mountain where the sun is the symbol or chariot or in a sense a symbol for the Lord. So basically uh, the sun passing through these particular constellations reaching the, its zenith, zenith being the top of the mountain in Cancer and Land Bountiful before it begins to descend again in its journey towards ultimately what we call the promised land. Um, but here what we understand is that we, we, we're just beginning to lay a foundation of these particular uh, symbols of the Mazarot or Zodiac that we that the story of the Book of Mormon is laid out to. Now in the next part, uh, this, this should give us a foundation to start off with, but in the next part we're going to go through chapters 18 and then we'll subsequently go through chapter 19 all the way till we reach the Promised Land. And we will show how Nephi's journey parallels the journey of the sun all the way through um, the cycle of the Maserot or the Zodiac. So by accident? No. Something that was intentionally put in there. But, you know, a lot of people want to say, oh, that Joseph Smith must have made it all up. And I'm over there going, well, if he did, he certainly knew what he was doing because um, his cycles and his patterns are consistent with those of ancient Israel. So if somebody can explain to me how someone in the 1800s with a, uh, a very um, limited education could come up with this intricate and interwoven interplay of symbols from an ancient Israelite theology and prophetic tradition that I'm sure they would have taught there. Oh, but that's right. According to some anti-Mormons right now, um, they're trying to say he went to Dartmouth College. Yeah, well, I doubt that. And not only do I doubt it, um, I doubt even if he did go to some place like that, that Dartmouth College in the 1800s in the 1800s had anywhere near this knowledge and the ability to teach someone of his age to uh, to write such a intricate and interwoven text involving many of the concepts of ancient Israel. But hey, you now maybe they had an 1800s version of Google. Who knows? But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this part of the presentation. Uh, part two will probably come up in the next two weeks, and uh, at which point we will continue our journey in the wilderness.